Hello and thanks very much for joining us. My name is Simon Kemp and I'm here to talk to you about artificial imagination. So this is all about how we achieve more right brain applications of artificial intelligence. Um, my name is also Eskimon. If you're on social media, please feel free to connect with me there on either Twitter or LinkedIn. Share with me your questions, your challenges. If you want to call bullshit on any of this, I'd be very interested in getting in a conversation with you about the stuff that I'm going to share over the next 15 to 20 minutes as well. I run a company called Kepios, which is a marketing consultancy. We help organizations to make sense of the future. Uh, but the good news is I'm not actually here to sell you any of that. Hopefully the next 15 to 20 minutes will give you a very clear demonstration of what that's all about. So as I mentioned, artificial imagination, a little bit of context for this. I firmly believe very much based on all the stuff we're seeing at the moment that artificial intelligence will define and shape the future of absolutely everything in our lives. Very exciting, perhaps not a view that's shared by everybody, but nonetheless, I think looking at the ways that things are moving at the moment, it's very clear that artificial intelligence will have the opportunity to play a role in almost every aspect of our lives. But that influence sort of splits into two different dimensions. So what we're looking at, in the, especially in the world of business, um, is the way that artificial intelligence can shape the way that we do things differently and better. And there's two different dimensions to that, as I mentioned. So we've got on one side the efficiency. This is all about doing the things that we're already doing in better or different ways. So fundamentally, that's about making our investments work harder and getting more for our buck. But on the other side is effectiveness. This is all about doing better things. So coming up with new and different ways of actually achieving the things that we care about and finding better solutions to those challenges as well. So it's about better results through new improved approaches and activities and not just about refining the things that we already do. And I think what's really interesting, though, is that when you look at this from an artificial intelligence perspective, those two dimensions depend on two distinct different applications of intelligence. So on the one side, you've got the logical sort of left brain thinking, which is all about reductive and logical approaches to solving problems. On the right hand side, where we were talking about effectiveness, though, this is very much more about imagination. So it's inventiveness and it's about creative ideation. Clearly very different uses of even the human brain. And it's absolutely the same when it comes to artificial intelligence as well. Now, what's really interesting is if you look at the way that artificial intelligence works at the moment, if you look at the majority of applications of artificial intelligence that are out there in the real world, the majority of those harness that left brain thinking. So the more logical, rational and reductive reductive approaches to thinking and ideation. So some of the best examples, I'm sure you've all seen these examples before. I'm not going to go into them into any detail, but AlphaGo, I think the really interesting thing about this is it has already beaten us at Go, but the thing is that Go is a game that humans invented. We set the rules for it, and artificial intelligence has simply found better ways of playing that game and beating us at it. Similarly for driverless cars, I mean, in terms of the technology and the algorithms that power that, incredibly sophisticated stuff and really impressive bits of technology. But again, these are driving very similar looking vehicles to the ones that we already drive ourselves, following the same rules of driving that we already follow on the roads that we've already built. So it's still just an improvement on something that already exists. It's a refinement of ideas that we've already come up with. And even when you get into something like the next Rembrandt, so I think what's really interesting about this is it definitely strays into the creation of new creative outputs. But nonetheless, this was still based on an iterative approach. They fed in loads and loads of examples of Rembrandt's previous work. And then based on patterns and rules that the algorithms calculated out of those inputs, they came up with basically a new variation on an existing theme. So you know, as I mentioned, these are really, really impressive bits of technology. And if you just look back even a few years, it's staggering how fast artificial intelligence has moved. But if we look at those in the strictest sense of creativity, these are not quite what we would term as imaginative or brand new kinds of things. So let's look at what that strict definition of creativity would be. Couldn't really be a strategist without giving you definitions out of a dictionary. So here is my obligatory slide. But creativity, according to Oxford Dictionaries, is the use of imagination and original ideas to create something new. And I think it's that imagination and the originality piece that we really want to be looking at when we talk about the next 
phase of the application of artificial intelligence because even the most creative applications of AI in today's world are variations on existing themes. So this is one of my favorite bits of AI use in the moment. Um, so this is Juke Deck. If you've seen this, this is a, a service that allows you to create music on demand just by clicking a couple of buttons and it will create what is effectively a new piece of music. But you'll notice that part of the process of creating some of these outputs is selecting from existing musical genres. We also select the mood that we want. We select the duration of all of that. So we're already feeding in our pre sort of conceived ideas of what music should be. So it's still an iteration of stuff that we've already got. The algorithms themselves are incredibly innovative, but the outputs in terms of the music that things like Juke Tech create, they are actually comfortingly familiar. So I'm, I'm a big techno fan. If you ever try and create some techno or some trance, some drum and bass using Juke Tech, it sounds incredibly convincing compared to the stuff that DJs today are already making, but that in itself suggests that it's still just an iteration of what we have already conceived as ideas. And it's that key difference that I want to talk about. So the difference between the iterative approaches that we've already got using a lot of these artificial intelligence processes compared to genuine innovation, something new that doesn't exist, those original ideas that that definition we saw just now talks about. Now, obviously, there are some very clear commercial opportunities in those left brains. So there's more iterative applications of AI that I've just been talking about. And that's kind of what's driving the great investments in them. We can see how these things benefit businesses without any trouble. They're fitting on this side of the model, though. So they are very much about doing things better and making those existing investments work harder. The thing that I think when I look at those applications, though, is that they're missing a lot of the real potential of AI. What's really interesting about AI compared to human intelligence is that artificial intelligence systems look at problems very differently to the way that humans do. Obviously, thinking is maybe a little bit of a stretch, is that is actually what it's doing. But if you think about the way that those processes approach a problem, they're going to do it in a very different way to the way that a human might do it. So this is kind of that shift. And we mentioned this on the efficiency versus effectiveness slide just now. But this is where most current AI applications are playing. We're looking at that doing things better. If we're going to really shift the creative needle and get more exciting applications of AI, we want to be down here doing the better things than new things, the inventive things. So what does that look like if you're in the world of AI? I mean, this is levels of creativity full stop, but specific to the world of AI as well. The most basic form is imitation. Now, it's arguable whether this is even creative, but you are still producing something new when you're imitating somebody else. So this is the most basic level of creativity, if you like. You then move one level up, iteration. So this is where the things like remixes would lie if you're copying an artist and trying to create something in their style. The new Rembrandt, sorry, the next Rembrandt very much fits into that iterative process, taking something that exists already but making a new version of it. You then get into this quite interesting area which is specific to the world of AI. So one of the really exciting bits that uh, we're seeing in the world of AI at the moment is the use of these algorithms to create inspiration for human-based ideas. So what we're looking at is we're feeding stuff into an AI system. And it's then spitting out outputs that inspire new ideas in humans. It's not necessarily massively creative in its own right, but it's a very important contribution to the AI process. Once you get to the right-hand side of this chart, though, this is where stuff starts to get a little bit more magic. So invention is where new ideas start to come out. Obviously, if you're inventing something, it doesn't exist already. It's something brand new. There's a lot of value and there's a lot of creative opportunity in that. But at the most extreme end of things, this is where we're going to get to the, the most amazing magic. A lot of people find this very uncomfortable, but this is actually where the really sort of sexy stuff comes in. When AI is capable of creating outputs of its own without even a brief from human beings, we know we've got to the stage where they're genuinely imaginative and inventive. They've not got a brief, they're sitting down with a blank canvas of their own, just as we used to do when we were children, and coming up with something completely new. So that's your sort of spectrum in there of the different levels of creativity. At the moment, we're at best, we're achieving this. We're definitely not at the right-hand side of the chart just yet. But when we break that down into that model that I shared earlier, once we get to sort of here, we're only just getting to the end of that left brain logical kind of thinking. It's only once we get to the far right hand side of the chart that you get into that more inventive right brain thinking, which is kind of where we want to get to if we want to achieve genuine creativity. So how do we actually get to that side of the chart? How do we get those more exciting right brain activities? And the secret to this is just 
as simple as changing the way that we brief. At the moment, we're very specific and prescriptive about the things that we're looking for from a lot of these AI applications. We're briefing for outputs. We're looking for an advert. We're looking for the next Rembrandt, whatever it may be. But what we're not asking a lot of the algorithms to do is to create ideas based on a desired outcome, which is obviously a lot more sort of loose in terms of its definition. So this is a little bit more about going to the doctor and asking for a specific medicine. This is going to the doctor and asking them to diagnose what it is that's wrong with you when you're not quite sure what's actually going on. So fundamentally, the secret to that better brief is just asking better questions rather than iterating or evolving existing answers. So a really good example is this. If you saw the stuff that happened at Facebook recently when they asked two chatbots to negotiate between each other, and those algorithms actually started to create their own language, that wasn't what the programmers asked them to do. You know, they didn't ask the systems to create their own language. They simply briefed for an outcome and as part of that, the algorithms actually came up with that language themselves. So it was almost like an accidental uh, result of the activity. Another really important part of achieving that more right brain imaginative activity, though, is changing the way that we as humans evaluate the creative outputs from AI. So at the moment, an awful lot of what we're looking for is this mini-me approach. We're sort of looking at the outputs and judging them in the same way that we would judge human outputs. And the trouble with that is that we're just going to end up replicating the same things again and again. What we're looking for when we evaluate current AI creative output is familiarity. Do we like this? Does it resonate with me as a human being? Whereas what we should be looking for is something genuinely original and new because that's where we start to get into that original sort of inventiveness, the right-hand side of that chart that I showed you previously. So creativity almost always is a means to an end. Sometimes that end is entirely emotional and subjective, but it's still a way of inspiring emotion. That's the output that we're looking for a lot of the time with artistic creativity. But if you think about the questions that you ask yourself when you evaluate creative outputs today, a lot of the time is, do I like it? Do I understand it? What does it make me feel? Rather than, I think, especially from an organizational perspective, where we're looking at AI as a business opportunity, does the output deliver what I need it to? Does it answer the brief? Does it actually help me to do things better than I was doing them before? So we're much more... When we're evaluating, you want to be much more on the right-hand side of that chart. By the way, if you do want to create art, so that, you know, the more expressive and emotional side of creativity, if that's what you're looking for, then it's not a question of changing the algorithms as much as it's about changing the stories that we tell ourselves about those outputs themselves. So this is a really, really interesting quote. So this is from, um, from David Cope, who is a musician who's been using algorithms to write music for the last 30 years. And he his sort of insight that just blew my mind when I read the whole uh, interview with him. He says that the feelings that we get from listening to music are not inherently there in the notes that are being played. They're things that we interpret as the listener based on our own emotional insights. And I think that's what's really, really important. Our emotional and sort of subjective response to creativity is what happens inside us. It's not something that's imposed on us by the creative output itself. I think one of the best examples of this is art, like this one from Jackson Paul. If you ever have had one of those discussions where you say, oh, I don't understand modern art, my kids could make it. Theoretically, it's also true that a computer, an algorithm, an artificially intelligent system could make something like this. So why do we decide that Jackson Pollock's work is worth millions of dollars from a creative perspective, and yet when we look at algorithms, we don't like the work that they do and we say that it's soulless? So what is that difference? What, how do we decide between the two different things? What's the difference between most of those creative endeavors that never actually even get welcomed by the light of day to something like a Jackson Pollock that actually becomes a cultural icon? So it, it's this one word, empathy. Now, empathy is one of those really interesting concepts because it's not universally defined, but at its most sort of basic, it's, its fundamental form, empathy is the ability to share the feelings of other people. And I think what's really interesting is when creativity inspires a shared emotion, when it triggers that sort of empathetic response, it becomes significantly more powerful. What's really interesting is that when we succeed as being empathetic individuals, as human beings, that empathy can help us to understand how to inspire emotions in other people through our creativity as well. Now, what's really interesting is that most people seem to think that empathy is a uniquely human trait. It's one of those things that's built on sort of instinct and human emotion. But actually, when you look at the way that 
people respond empathetically to each other in different cultures, there's actually a lot of variation in those empathetic response. And based on that, it's very clear that an awful lot of empathy is actually learned. Now, what's really interesting about that from an artificial intelligence and algorithm perspective is that anything that can be learned can also be encoded. And that leads us to the possibility that, in fact, this is a very likely probability of systems that have artificial empathy as well. So you can imagine at that point, if you've got a system that's artificially empathetic, that's artificially creative, there's a very real chance that it's actually going to do all the things that you can do as well. Will you lose your job to one of those systems that is artificially empathetic and creative? But reality, probably not, actually. Here's the funny thing, right? Time at work is a bit like gas in a vacuum. It automatically expands to fill all of the available space. I have never met a boss in my entire career that didn't find a way of filling up all my time with an activity that they asked me to do. So the chances are, even if these machines can actually replicate a lot of our outputs, your boss will probably still find other things to keep you busy at work. Your real trick if you want to stay valuable at work, though, is just to find out how you as an individual can inspire even more powerful emotions than machines and those artificially empathetic creative systems can inspire. Now, I've got loads more ideas I'd love to share with you on that, but unfortunately, that's all I've got time for today. If you do want to continue this conversation with me, though, I would love to connect with you on social media. You'll find me as Eskimon on both LinkedIn and Twitter. But with that, thanks very much for joining me this evening, and I look forward to speaking to you again online or in person very soon.